Thank you for coming today. I'm really excited to introduce Brittany. She's been fantastic. Um, Brittany originally is from Southwest Florida, um, and she told us that she got an early interest in backyard birds there because her backyard birds were things like painted buntings. So if you're not from around here, you know if it's a really good bird and one that would spur interest in birds for pretty much anybody. Um, from there, she earned a bachelor's degree in conservation biology and Caribbean and Latin American studies from St. Lawrence University in New York, where she was involved in a variety of research projects, including looking at the efficacy of artificial wetlands on contaminant removal, the effect of temperature on protein expression in freshwater mussels, and the effect of forest structure on mammalian diversity. Um, but then she was able to return to her first love, birds, in Kansas, where she studied the nest nesting ecology of grassland birds. In addition to all of that research experience, Brittany brings independence, dedication, and humor to everything she does. It's been a pleasure working with her. Brittany will be starting a job with FWC at Triple N Ranch in Bull Creek Wildlife Management Area in the next week, and we hope that means she comes and visits us. Um, and I'm very excited for her to share her project with you. Take it away, Brittany. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, and uh, I appreciate the kind words. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, answering the question, does e Eastern Meadowlark abundance impact rates of song switching? So let's get started. So why do birds sing anyway? This is a pretty common question uh, when anyone comes into contact with a birds and bird song. Um, so often bird song is used as a form of communication, both for mates and for territorial defense. Um, but the ability for a bird to defend its territory and its mate really depends on its repertoire size. Um, and there's some reasons uh, why a larger repertoire size may be beneficial, but there's also some reasons as to why they were formed in the first place. So maybe the repertoire size uh, helps reduce the habituation in the listener. So when a bird is switching songs, it's kind of reestablishing its connection with whoever's listening to the song. Um, maybe it helps stimulate an area that has a high density of individuals. So a bird with lots of song can kind of uh, fake out other individuals uh, when they think there's lots of birds here, there's so many, so many songs happening. Um, so maybe they vacate. And then finally, maybe it helps reduce muscle fatigue. So maybe they use different muscles with different songs so they can sing for a little bit longer. And one of the main things I noticed when I first uh, came to Buck Island Ranch was a singing meadowlark on a fence post, uh, which kind of inspired me to look into this a little bit further with my research. Um, so Eastern meadowlarks are pretty iconic for their song uh, for good reason. Uh, they have a pretty large repertoire of 50 to 80 different songs. Uh, for reference, the Western meadowlark, a uh, pretty closely related species, um, they only have a repertoire of like five to 12 songs. Um, and so they are they require grasslands for breeding. Um, and so they have experienced a decline in population in recent years, just because their habitat is uh, kind of being destroyed by human development. Um, but their song is iconic for the grasslands. Um, and when I say they're discontinuous singers, I mean, they sing one song a few times before switching to a new song. Um, but during courtship, they, ex they exhibit rapid song switching um, that kind of peaks during courtship and increases during male to male competitive interactions. Um, and so this is the information that I kind of use to create my research project. So I wanted to answer a few questions uh, with my research. Uh, first, I wanted to ask, uh, how are Eastern meadowlarks distributed at Buck Island Ranch? Um, and then I wanted to look into uh, how does the abundance of meadowlarks in a pasture impact uh, song versatility in individuals. So I kind of figured uh, if meadowlarks are shown for areas with less woody plant presence and more grass, uh, their abundance would be higher in pastures, uh, in improved pastures. And then if uh, there are more meadowlarks in a pasture, song versatility will be higher for individuals just because there's more uh, competitive interactions happening between males. And so my study site uh, is Buck Island Ranch. It's a roughly 10,000 acre active cattle ranch uh, in central Florida. Um, it's pretty diverse when it comes to bird. There's uh, 162 bird species recorded here. And I actually got to add a species to this list pretty recently. I cited two blue grass beaks. Um, and so there's plenty more to discover. 
Uh, but you can see with all my pictures, there's quite a cast of characters we have here. Um, and it was a really cool place to work. So at Buck Island Ranch, we have 16 different experimental pastures that are used for all sorts of projects. Um, so there's eight semi-native pastures. And as you can guess by the name, uh, they're mostly native plant species. Um, and it's not fertilized and there's minimal cattle grazing going on here. Um, and it's pretty much a snapshot of what a semi-native prairie would look like. There's still some planted for species. Um, but there's also improved pastures, which are created for the purpose of cattle management. Uh, they're fertilized and they're planted with uh, forage species like bahia grass, and they are uh, grazed pretty often by the cattle. But these uh, experimental pastures have um, a burn schedule. So there's within each treatment, there's four patch burns, meaning uh, a third of the pasture is burned every year. And then there's also four full burns. So the whole pasture is burned every three years. And so uh, going into my data collection, um, I did some point count surveys uh, just to see what kind of birds were utilizing these pastures. Uh, so I surveyed 44 points across 16 of the experimental pastures uh, every month, and I would record every bird that I would see in here um, within uh, the 50 and 100 meter buffers, which are represented by those circles on the map. And so you can see on the map, um, all of the pastures that are in the lighter green, those are improved pastures. And then all of the pastures uh, kind of on the outside in the darker green, those are semi-native. Um, in addition to my point counts, I always also collected some habitat information, um, like woody shrub presence, uh, grass presence, uh, kind of different vegetative structures that are present in the pastures. And you can see in the smaller map, um, that's what a final pasture would look like after I did my data collection. So each point represents um, a bird that I saw uh, during the five minutes that I was there. And so in these pastures, I would record songs from individuals. Um, so from May to June, I visit eight of the experimental pastures to record meadowlarks. And uh, those are highlighted in the red outline in that map on the left, on the right, excuse me. And then I would record one individual for an hour. And so I would follow this bird around um, with my microphone, <laughs> trying to gather all of the songs that he was singing. Um, and I eventually ended up with a sample size of 21 individuals. So it was two to three per pasture. And you can see in my picture uh, in the middle there, that's me and my directional microphone. And there's a bird in that uh, tree snag. So I was recording him uh, collecting as much song as I could. And so there's a few variables that I was looking at uh, for my data analysis. Uh, I was looking at song type versatility, which is the number of distinct songs in a sequence. And then I was looking at transition versatility, which is the number of switches between the two different songs. Um, and then I looked at total versatility, which is a product of the song type versatility and transition versatility. And so I also used um, Cornell's bioacoustics program called Raven to look at uh, spectrograms of my metal arc songs. And so I'll just play uh, some of these so you can get a, an idea for what they sound like. So you can see um, by ear, it's pretty easy to differentiate between the different songs. And obviously visually, the structures are pretty different as well. So it was pretty easy for me to go through and count uh, total songs and the total number of different songs and uh, the other variables that I collected. And so here's an example calculation of um, my numbers that I collected. So I would collect the total song in an hour, and then I would count the total different songs that occurred. And then I would also uh, make note of the number of switches that occurred. And so uh, individual F3 was actually my most, uh, had the highest song versatility out of all, out of all the birds that I recorded. Um, so we sung 103 songs in an hour. And of those songs, six of them, they were all different from each other. And then he switched an astonishing 51 times. Like it was insane. And so uh, song type versatility is the um, total different songs divided by the total songs in an hour. And then transition versatility is the number of switches that occurred over the number of switches that could have occurred. Um, and then you get those two decimals and then you multiply them together to get total versatility. So how are Eastern Marlocks distributed at Buck Island Ranch? 
Um, I found that improved pastures have significantly more meadowlarks than semi-native pastures. Um, and this was a pretty interesting result that we got. Uh, but I also noticed that the difference was not influenced by the burn treatment. Uh, so you can see in my box plot uh, here, the improved pastures clearly have uh, a higher metal arc abundance than the semi-native, uh, but the burns, uh, the patch burn versus the full burn, there's not a real significant difference there. Uh, so there's some other factors that must be causing this result. I wanted to look into this a little bit more closely with my habitat assessment information. Um, so I looked at the percentage of grass and woody shrub, and they both had a pretty strong influence on the mean metal arc abundance. I saw that as the percentage of grass in a pasture increased, the mean metal arc abundance also increased. And then there was an inverse relationship between woody shrub and mean metal arc abundance. So as woody shrub increased, uh, the mean metal arc abundance in a pasture would decrease. So how does this abundance of metal arcs uh, affect song versatility? So I found overall um, that the mean metal arc abundance doesn't really impact transition versatility among individuals. Um, so even as uh, the abundance increased in a pasture, the birds weren't uh, switching that's their songs according to this uh, increase. And I also found uh, song type versatility uh, was not really influenced by mean metal arc abundance. Um, so the birds weren't exhibiting uh, higher songs, higher different, uh, higher rates of different songs um, as the metal arc abundance increased in the pasture. And finally, I found that total song versatility uh, wasn't really influenced by mean metal arc abundance. And so there's a few factors that could have caused this, uh, but you can see uh, among individuals, it's pretty large range. Um, so I think there's definitely some some other biological factors that are influencing this more. And so overall, I found that Eastern meadowlarks at Buck Islands, they're more abundant in improved pasture than in semi-native pastures. Um, and this is, seems to be influenced by the woody shrub presence and is, as well as the grass presence. Um, but I also found that the burn schedule in the experimental pastures don't really have a strong influence on abundance. And um, this is a trend that is seen in various other studies about metal arcs. They're not too affected by their burn schedule like other grass and bird species are. Um, so I definitely think there's more data collection that can be done in this regard. Um, but overall, I found the social implications of a higher metal arc abundance in a pasture doesn't really influence an individual's singing habits. And so there's a few reasons for this as well. Um, there are a few studies of metal arcs done where they found that the birds exhibit the highest versatility during courtship. And so this, for Florida, that'd probably be in March and April, whereas I did most of my recordings in May and June. So maybe the timing was just off for me to capture the full picture of what's happening in individuals. And so maybe the territories are already established and they're not using as much energy uh, with their songs and they're more focused on um, other breeding things that metalworks do. Um, and there's also some other uh, biological factors that can be considered like age, maybe as a metal arc gets older, uh, they have uh, kind of a difference in their singing behaviors um, as well as their overall song repertoire. Like I said earlier, they have a range of 50 to 80 songs. It depends on the individual. And so maybe if a bird has a lower on the lower end of the range, they're not exhibiting as much versatility as the higher, higher uh, repertoire sizes. And so it seems that the, uh, the environment that they're inhabiting isn't really influencing their behavior in that regard. So just some recommendations for future studies. Um, I think this is a very interesting realm that could be worked on further. So like I said, uh, you can investigate other potential factors that are influencing metal arc uh, song choices. And so that could include things like age and song repertoire. You can look at uh, individually if birds with larger repertoires exhibit a little bit different singing behavior than individuals with smaller repertoires. And you can also look at uh, other behavioral factors that deal with nesting. So you can investigate the relationship between the total time singing in an hour and uh, the nesting or fledgling success. So if a male is singing more, he will be providing less energy uh, for his offspring. So maybe there's an influence there. The birds are singing less because they're off busy doing other things. 
And finally, just an overall uh, question for the working landscape is how pasture type is influencing uh, nesting success. And so Buck Island Ranch, there's lots of cattle around, there's lots of other projects happening. So it would be interesting to see um, how that influences nesting success, but not of only meadowlarks, but of other bird species here as well. Um, Buck Island Ranch is a very unique habitat and I think it'd be interesting uh, to continue on with the bird research here. Um, there's lots of potential and lots of things to be discovered for sure. So I just want to thank uh, everyone who's helped me out with my research. Um, so shout out to Dr. Angela Tringali, Dr. Reed Bowman, Dr. Betsy Bowen, and Dr. Gary Sonier, uh, and Vivian for all the research help. Uh, Vivian helped create the point count maps. So without her, I wouldn't have a project. So thanks, Vivian. And also a uh, shout out to Marcia. He helps me uh, pick out some microphones and some recording devices. So he definitely helped in that regard as well. And uh, thanks for to LTAR for the funding for this internship. Um, I learned a lot and it was really exciting to be able to uh, conduct research at the ranch. Um, so thank you all for coming and I will take any questions. All right, I can read the questions if you'd like, or Angela, if, if you'd like to read them. Um, I can read them. So it looks like Reed has a question in the chat. Reed asks, did you get a sense that reproduction, uh, maybe measured as the number of recent fledglings seen, differed between the pasture types? And then he had a follow-up, could improved pastures be ecological traps? <clears throat> Yeah, so I noticed that I didn't really notice a difference between uh, the semi-native and improved pasture when it came to fledglings. Um, it kind of varied by the individual. I would see some with four fledglings and then I would see some with like one. Um, so I think it really depends on um, some other factors. Um, as for the ecological traps, um, I mean, there's definitely potential there. Um, it could be that the more fit Easter meadowlarks are in the semi-native pastures, and so they're defending their territory a bit better. Um, and then all of the other meadowlarks are kind of pushed toward this lower, lower quality habitat. Um, but there's definitely more research that needs to be done in that regard. I can't uh, answer that question solidly with the information and the observations that I saw. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Chelsea also has a question. She says, great job, Brittany. They seem to be selecting against increased woody vegetation. Did height of vegetation have an influence on their abundance as well? I did not actually look at the height of the vegetation. Um, most of the improved pastures, the grass was pretty short uh, just because it was grazed. Um, it was like up to my ankle at the most. Um, but I feel like maybe in the semi-native pastures, um, there are some higher grasses and some higher taller trees. Um, so I feel like uh, maybe they're selecting against that sort of um, environment. But from what I noticed, um, it seemed that there was just higher abundance in improved pastures, uh, regardless of the vegetative height. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there's more questions in the Q&A. Um, Greg asks, do you think your presence when you recorded them affected the degree of song switching and the choice of songs? Yeah, there's definitely, um, that's an issue that we need uh, to kind of uh, account for when you're recording, when you're doing any sort of behavioral studies. Uh, thankfully, I kind of did some practice recordings in uh, April to see if my presence really influenced that. And I noticed that, um, they're pretty uh, confident in their ability to fly away from me. So they didn't really seem to mind my presence. Um, there were definitely some times where I would kind of crouch down and hide. So they would feel like I wasn't a threat. Um, but that's definitely um, something that should be investigated a little bit further, just because I know it varies by species. There's some species that are a little sensitive to human presence and then others where um, they're not as sensitive. But in my personal observation, they didn't seem very sensitive to my presence. 
Um, well, that personal observation is backed up by Lydia's personal observation, who says, I've noticed that when I'm working near a meadowlark, it takes a lot for them to be bothered by my presence enough to stop singing, but I haven't listened for versatility. Do you think presence of a human observer would have any impact on the number of songs or song switching? For sure, yeah. Um, I saw a pretty large range of song switching in my raw data. So for example, that individual F3, he had 51 song switches, which was the highest of all the individuals I recorded. Um, but then there were some other individuals that would switch zero times in the whole hour. So they would just sing the same song over and over and over again. Um, so it could definitely be based on the individual, but also uh, just based on if the bird even has a larger repertoire that they would want to demonstrate. Um, so I think that it definitely depends on what the individual is wanting to do with his time. <laughs> but there was definitely, uh, it would sometimes it would take them a long time for them to switch songs. So they'd be singing the same song for 30 minutes and then they'd finally switch it up. Um, so I think it kind of depends on what their mood is and what their goal is with their singing. Thanks, Brittany. Um, Hillary has a question. She asks if productivity in the improved pastures could result in higher food availability. Um, and then she asks if your metal lark numbers are comparable to what Emma Wilcox saw in an earlier paper um, based on George Tanner's work in the summer and winter stocking cattle density pasture experiment. Yeah, for sure. Um, so to answer the first question, um, Meadowlarks usually are eating like grasshoppers and bugs and sort of things. So I think uh, if a pasture doesn't really have a lot of uh, good habitat for uh, the bugs and the insects, uh, then the meadowlarks probably will have to move on. Um, as for the productivity, it's hard to say because I didn't necessarily look at um, their behavior when it came to uh, like their hunting and if they were eating a lot. Um, but I can only assume if there's a lot of uh, meadowlarks in an improved pasture, uh, there's plenty of bugs for them to eat. Um, and for the second question, um, I actually used that, that study to kind of uh, gain some information about uh, Buck Island Ranch and kind of help me with my research. And so she saw, I think like a thousand meadowlarks like during her study. And I would agree with it. There are a lot of meadowlarks here. Um, and she also saw that meadowlarks were more present in improved pastures and my uh, findings do uh, follow up with that. Okay. Great, thanks Brittany. Uh, Scott and Chef had some questions for you also, but Laura's telling us it is time to move to our next speaker, so we'll have to catch them later. Yes, I'll answer your questions later. <laughs> yes, we will send out a follow-up email with any unanswered questions and answers. So, all right. Thank you so much, Brittany, that was wonderful. Um, now, Dr. Reed Bowman, the Director of Avian Ecology will introduce our next speaker. Hey everybody, our next speaker is James Longo. So um, James comes to us from New York, uh, having done his bachelor's degree at uh, the esteemed State University of New York, uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. I can hear Angela clapping. Um, uh, James had quite a diverse range of experiments up in the Adirondack Mountains in uh, uh, Northern New York as a forest restoration crew leader and uh, invasive species steward. Um, but around the time he graduated, he really got back to birds and interested in working on birds. He, he did an uh, internship at a place called the Tin Mountain Conservation Center, but what was really important there was that he got the opportunity to do point counts in, a, among a variety of different things. But James, in his letter to us, um, pointed out a really interesting observation, which was when you do point counts, how much you rely on vocalizations to, un, to estimate abundance. Um, and that got him really interested in avian vocalizations and also how avian vocalizations could be used to record abundance. And that of course got him interested in a variety of other things related to abundance and number of individuals and things like that. Uh, he also did uh, a project working as a field biologist on loons um, and then decided to pursue an internship at Archbold. So, um, James is, is probably one of the most even keeled interns I've had. He took on a 
a, a challenging project and nothing really seemed to bother him. He just would sort of knuckle down and solve the problem. He's also taught himself, you know, I am not uh, an expert in vocal analysis and he has taught himself a tremendous amount of information and analytical techniques in his work, which is not unlike a little bit of what Brittany has just talked about. So at this point, I'll turn it over to James to introduce this topic. Thank you. Flattering as always, Reed. Um, let me make sure I'm doing this. Okay, sure, sound. Okay, is that good? Everybody can see me and hear me? So hello everyone. My name is James Longo. Thank you all Wait, for tuning I can, in. Sorry, I can see your notes in front of your screen. Uh oh. Okay. Well then, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you about uh, vocalizations and specifically the interplay between sociality and communication. Um, a hypothesis that I think represents the interplay between sociality and communication well is the social complexity hypothesis for communicative complexity. And this postulates a rather straightforward relationship between social complexity and communication complexity, which is to say that in more complex social environments, you'll tend to find more complex communication systems. We can trace this all the way back to 1809 with Lamarck's quote in reference to the evolution of human language that states, the individuals having largely increased their need according as the societies which they formed became larger, had to multiply their ideas to an equivalent extent to, to an equivalent extent. We may imagine that this will have compelled them to increase and vary in the same degree the signs which they use for communicating these ideas. So this is a pretty straightforward hypothesis to test. And so what that means is you would expect to find in species with more complex social systems, a more complex communication system. And that is what we tend to find. Some examples are ground dwelling rodents with more distinct social roles will have more distinct alarm calls that they can use. And primates that live in larger troop sizes tend to have a larger repertoire of signs that they use to communicate. So I've been using the term complexity a lot and we need to get some tight definitions on that. And I'll be referring to how complexity is used in information theory, which means that you can think of it in a similar sense as uncertainty or surprise in, a, in, in terms of an outcome of an expected event. So an example would be something with more possible outcomes like comparing a dice roll to a coin toss, a dice roll would be more complex because you're less certain of the outcome because there's more possible choices, six as opposed to two. The second factor that's important is how certain you are of which outcome is going to occur. So a weighted die as opposed to a normal six-sided die, a normal six-sided die would be more complex because you're less certain of the outcome, whereas a weighted die would favor one outcome more than another, making it less complex. So we can apply this to a scrub J's social life and to its communication abilities. First, I'll give you a little bit of background on how you would define a complex complexity within scrub J social lives. They're cooperative breeders, which means that they have a few distinct roles. The first of which is a breeder, which the breeders are the two dominant adults responsible for all the reproduction. Helpers are unique to cooperative breeders in that they are previous offspring of the breeders who stay into early adulthood and help to raise their younger siblings. Juveniles are like a step below a helper. They're you know, a young bird who's still hanging out with the family, but they're not quite as helpful as the helpers. And then fledglings are more analogous to a human toddler where um, they're dependent on the older members of the family and they're not uh, contributing in any meaningful way per se. And another important factor is that they're year round territory holders. These birds don't migrate, they live in the same place. So interacting with their neighbors is a daily occurrence and that's a large part of their sociality is interacting oftentimes with a lot of the same birds. As for communication complexity, I've chosen conversation gutturals as the vocalizations to study for this. Um, part of why I did that is because they're highly variable. They're not stereotyped like you would expect of a lot of alarm calls or um, some bird songs, although not all bird songs are highly stereotyped. And another aspect that's very important for this is that they, although their precise functions are not quite known, they're, it's obvious and agreed upon that they have an apparent role in social cohesion, which makes them likely the correct vocalization to study when trying to study the coevolution of sociality and communication. 
So from this, you can derive some testable hypotheses. The H null is obviously that social context has no effect on communication complexity. And I've broken the social complexity aspect into two different hypotheses, H1 being that group size is positively associated with communication complexity. And the H2 is social heterogeneity, which I'm defining as there being multiple social roles or families present in the same social context, whereas only one of each would be homogenous that that is positively associated with communication complexity. So in order to test this, I would need to uh, record vocalizations from uh, different areas of varying social complexity. And after trying a few different methodologies, what I landed on was this. I placed my microphone, which is that small green device on the left, out in the open, at least two meters from all vegetation, with some peanuts in front of it. The idea being that the birds would come and feed, gather more than one at a time in an open area where I could observe each one that was coming down to feed. While they're doing this, they speak to each other and the microphone picks it up. And I would sample each family for 15 minutes. And during that time into a microphone would dictate the band combinations of what birds are entering or exiting the, what I would call the social context. So I'll play a short clip while I'm explaining that. These birds come in and out of, and of what I would define as the social context, which is the area within earshot of a feeding bird. So a bird typically would come down, maybe they'll talk to each other and communicate whatever they're communicating and then fly away and bring a peanut away. This means that over the course of a sample, I would have a timeline of what birds are present at what time so that later when I'm analyzing the vocalizations and I see, okay, there was a, this, this sound happened at three minutes. I know what birds were there and which ones potentially said it and which ones potentially heard it. And this is all said and done. I had about 20 hours of audio to process and I did so in Raven and I analyzed the spectrograms. And I'm going to, do, going to briefly explain what a spectrogram is. Although if you just watched Brittany's talk, you got a pretty good idea, but it's basically, it allows you to see sound. So I'll play the sound of a canyon run right now to give you an example. You can see as the frequency or pitch goes down, the, 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 you can see the visual symbols are just the, the sound that you're seeing. As it gets lower, it's lower pitched. And as it gets wider, it's longer. So it's just a visual representation of that. And this is a small sample of what some of the conversation gutturals look like. So you can see there's a lot of variability. But the first question we need to ask is, are these calls discrete or continuous? Measuring the complexity is going to be different if you can place them all into discrete categorical bins, as opposed to them being continuous where uh, each of the uh, factors of the call just flow together in a continuum. So to do this, I decided to use three different sorting methods and then compare them all to each other to see if we could find an answer. The first one is called dimensionality reduction. So I'll play this briefly so that you can um, get a sense for what these spectrograms sound like. It's kind of quiet, it goes whoa. That's my impression of it. I'll play it one more time. And so the idea behind dimensionality reduction is you take quantifiable aspects that you can compare between all the calls. This first one I've highlighted is F1, which is the onset frequency of the bottom band. I hope you can see my mouse, but if not, the bottom band is that the bottom part of the shape that you're seeing. F2 is the frequency of the inflection. So if it bends up or bends down, what is the extreme frequency of that? F3 is the offset frequency. T1 is the duration of the call. DI is the difference between the onset and the inflection. And then DF is the change in frequency from the beginning of the call to the end of the call. And once I've done this, now you can quantify the call as a series of six numbers. With these six numbers, I can use principal component analysis and the computer can use k-means clustering to take all the calls and categorize them into groups that it deems appropriate as distinct categories. And this is what that looks like. Each number is a different call and these polygons that you're seeing that are different colors are the computer's idea of how to separate the calls the best into what would be discrete groups. A method to compare to this is manual sorting. So this is something that you might already be doing at home where it's just a human deciding which call do you think is, should be categorized with another call. So for me, the center one and the bottom left one look pretty similar. The middle left and the top center look pretty similar. So I might group them together, but you might disagree. So it's beneficial to have a lot of different human opinions and to average them out over each other. And that's exactly what we did. We got a few boxes of pizza and the bird lab together and we all printed out the spectrograms and debated with each other about what group should go in what group. And this is uh, what that looked like. It was a whole lot of fun. And another 
um, benefit that humans have over computers is you get to come up with fun names for the calls. The computer tends to just name them call type one, two, three, four, but we named them Stripey, Croak, Krakatoa, The Wave, Diminishing Returns, and Whoop based on um, what they sound like. So that was a, that was a really fun part of it. Um, method, method three is spectrogram correlation, which is the idea that the computer can take two spectrograms, overlay them, and when they blend together, how similar were those two images? So these two are pretty similar and their value is 0.494. That's a pretty high value for spectrogram correlation. I'll contrast that with these two, which are dissimilar. They go over each other. You can obviously see the difference there. And the value is low, 0.146. So that comes up with a similarity matrix after the computer compares every possible combination of calls. And then you can cluster it using k-means analysis the same way that you would with um, principal components. So if you remember what the principal component k-means analysis groups looked like, this one has a lot more overlaps between groups, which means that this method was a lot less confident in defining uh, discrete call types. So with all those three methods done, you compare each one to each other and check for concordance. And there's a lot of bars going on here, but the main takeaway is that the three methods largely do not agree with each other. I've highlighted in green, really the only two times when two methods agreed with each other. But so in lieu of, a mass, in lieu of concordance between the three methods, there's only two things that are possible, really. One of these methods is correct, and we have no way of knowing which one it is, or none of these methods are correct and it's a continuous call type system, and it's not appropriate to place them into categorical bins. Or it, there is a correct way to place them into categorical bins, but these methods are all wrong and the continuous is wrong. Without knowing and without being able to conduct an entire another experiment to find out, I have to treat them as quantifiable aspects. So I used the mathematical quantifiable parts of the calls that I determined during the first method, and then used the spread of the principal components from the mean to conduct, to figure out which of my independent variables had the largest effect on distance from the mean. And so if you look at this ANOVA and then the generalized linear model, um, the context attendance, which is how many birds were present within earshot when the vocalization happened, was the only strong predictor, predictor of dispersion of principal components from the mean. So what that a way to visualize that is these blue dots were all, all representative vocalization that was recorded in a small context, and the red dots are large. And you can see that the red dots are spread out over a larger area and are less concentrated around the mean, which means that when there's more birds around, the vocalizations differentiate from the norm. This is another way of visualizing that with, two, with red, again, being the histograms for the large context and the blue context. This blue uh, histogram that's skewed far to the left that heart, that's back to the analogy of the weighted die. You know a lot more of what's going to happen because one outcome is a lot more favored. Whereas the red, where you're getting this more flat distribution, that's getting closer to an even die where the, there's more options that are more evenly possible to happen. And so the complexity is higher in the large groups because you have less certainty of what's going to happen. One implication of this, if, there are, if it does turn out to be that there are distinct call types, is that this dispersion is necessary. It's a necessary prerequisite for there to be various call types. If you don't have enough dispersion from the mean, then you, the receiver wouldn't have enough information to be able to differentiate call types and then possibly evolve meaning to encode within those differentiable call types. So if we revisit our hypotheses, the only one that my data supports is H1, that group size is possibly associated with communication complexity discussion about these results. The statement that I can say is these results indicate that larger group sizes are associated with greater dispersion of vocalization characteristics. There are two um, explanations for this that come to mind. One is vocal individuality, the idea that individuals want to be able to differentiate themselves from others just by being able to hear them, just like a human voice, you know, who's speaking just by hearing it. There may be more need to differentiate your voice when you're in a larger group to remain unique than a smaller group, or it's possible that gutturals encode meaningful information and that larger groups require more meaningful information to be communicated in order to navigate the complexity of that social environment. So some future studies that I would like to know the answer to is how do Florida scrub jays perceive conversation gutturals? At the end of the day, we can categorize them however we want. But if Florida scrub jays perceive them in a certain way, as, as, as in the case of categorical bins that they determine, then that's the final correct answer. So you would need to know that in order to really solidly say how they should be categorized. 
and a comparison of conversation voc conversational vocalizations between cooperative breeding and non-cooperative breeding scrub jay species would be interesting because you would expect that cooperative breeding species would have a greater diversity of conversational vocalizations due to the complexity of their social lives. So I think I'm running out of time here. So I'll do a quick thank you to Archbold Biological Station for hiring me and having me, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for the Raven software that was indispensable for my project, uh, the Avian Ecology Lab for everything and being my family away from family and all the interns out there. There isn't a field station that I know of that would uh, last a day without all these hardworking interns. So uh, keep on keep it on everybody. Um, here are some references for things that I mentioned, and I'll open the floor now to any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Um, that's, that was great. Um, let me go to the chat first and see what kinds of questions we got. Um, so let's see. Good stumpies. <laughs> Go Stumpy. Um, Scott Ward says, really great job of breaking down complex stats and methods. Um, and that's a metal art question. Uh, <laughs> anybody else have any questions? If you do, put them into uh, the chat or the Q&A. Um, Bryce says, do you know of any studies on other species that compare human and computer classifications of vocalizations? And if so, what were the results? Were there yep. similar inconsistencies in the human and computer classifications? Yeah, so af actually, after I had finished doing all these three sorting methods, I discovered a paper that did the exact same three sorting methods with chickadee call types which is cool and validating, but I also probably should have done a better literature search and not missed it. But so between the manual sorting spectrogram correlation and principal component analysis and chickadee call types, they found pretty strong concordance between the three models of those call types, whereas we did not. So that's uh, kind of indicative that either these call types aren't as distinct as chickadees or that it is possibly a, a continuous call or uh, continuous communication system. Um, I'll ask a question, James. Um, so in your large groups, you had more birds um, than in your small groups. How do you know that um, there is actual individual variation and it's not the, the, the differences aren't simply just because you had more birds that might be presenting different conversation guttural types? Yeah, so I can take the I know all the individuals that were present. I don't necessarily know the individuals that were um, vocalizing, but how it works out with the large group is there were actually less individuals represented than the small groups. So if if it were, you know, just variation per individual speaking, you would actually expect the small groups to um, contribute more because when you sample a small family, the most you're going to get is um, two birds, two or three birds talking at a time. When you sample a large family, you get the two or three birds every so often as well, but you also get the three, four, five, six that contribute to the big group. So the small group actually had more individuals that could have possibly been speaking. So that, um, that to me helps satisfy the idea that it might just be the fact that there's more individuals being represented in the one sample size. But the lack of knowing specifically what individual is vocalizing was um, a flaw that I would like to see rectified with a better study design. Uh, Hillary also asks, do you think there may be differences in calls produced in relation to the surrounding J dominance categories rather than simply the large or small number of individuals? Yeah, so I did do a little bit of that in my exploratory analysis when I was looking at the, the social class heterogeneity where, you know, perhaps maybe there's a, um, there's a breeder and a juvenile together versus a, a, a breeder and a, and a helper or something like that. And um, what it largely seemed was that there was just more of, well, what we would call the wave, kind of lower amplitude squealy calls. You would get that when there was less dominant birds around more dominant birds. But overall, it didn't seem like there was much else of a difference. It was, it was, it seemed pretty incredibly even the, the, 
contribution of different call types, regardless of the social classes present. It was not, um, did not turn out to be very significant, which was surprising to me. I really thought that that was gonna be a very significant factor of what they communicated. Uh, Larry asks, um, and I think you talked about it, that it's one of your, uh, your size groups, your small groups included single birds. And he asked, were you lucky enough to hear a single bird essentially talking to itself and if so, what do you think the purpose is of a conversation guttural when a bird's alone? Yeah, so I had, I think it was, it was only like nine, I think, it was, I think it was less than 10 samples of a time when a bird was by itself. I mean, it was so rare that I, I honestly kind of assumed that I missed another bird, but um, it, it, if I didn't miss another bird and they, they really were communicating to themselves, I mean, I can't, it must just have some sort of maybe internal physiological effect on them, or maybe you're like the, a human muttering to yourself is that's kind of for you, but it could be trying to, um, well, I guess it wouldn't even be trying to locate another individual because you'd probably use a loud call for that, wouldn't you? I don't know. The sample size was so small for single birds that I suspected that I either missed a bird or the bird thought that there was another bird around. Okay, well, I think we're out of questions and probably out of time, James. So thank you okay. very, thank much. You very much. And um, we'll go on to our next speaker. If you could stop sharing your screen, okay. James. Great. So our next speaker is uh, Grace Tranquina. Uh, Grace is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a bachelor's degree in natural resources and environmental science but specifically with a concentration in resource conservation and restoration ecology. Um, the first years that, that Grace was at um, University of Illinois, she worked at the Morgan Arboretum, which is an amazing botanical garden, um, where she did a whole bunch of different things, restoring uh, wetlands by removal of invasive species, um, learned, a, tremendous amount of plant identification and doing transects and vegetative surveys um, and participating in community outreach about plants. But she is not a plant ecology intern. <laughs> so Grace found the light and uh, she was a research associate at the University of North Texas working on a project on um, painted buntings, which is probably just a really cool bird uh, to be able to work on with an old colleague of mine. Um, and there she got to do a lot of work on um, using GPSs to, to do surveys for them using transects. Um, also did a lot of mist netting, banding, birds, learning to bleed. Um, and so she was really interested in further pursuing her, her interest in birds uh, with an internship here. So. Grace was a, a, also a delight to work with. Also very even keeled. There was very little that seemed to upset her and also um, very entrepreneurial. This was a project that builds on a previous intern's project but she brought some new ideas to it and, and new insights. In fact, yesterday at our meeting, she just blurted out that she'd suddenly seen the light about all this stuff. And it was really interesting to listen what her ideas were. So Grace uh, and Grace is uh, going on, has a job working for NSF at, in Denton, Texas, and is possibly looking at pursuing a master's degree in uh, Newfoundland, which <laughs> might be a shock. <laughs> Certainly a big change from Florida. So Grace, without further ado, it's All you. right. Thank you, Reed. Let me get um, my screen going here. Share. We got my PowerPoint. Okay. How are we? How are we looking here? Got to switch it. Looks good. No, you do need to switch it. Your notes are appearing again. Okay. Swap. Well. How's We're that? actually seeing two slides simultaneously. There you go. That's good. Okay. Okay. Great. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around for our triple feature today. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, project I did 
on the effect of pair bond duration and sentinel coordination in the Florida scrub jay here at R12 Research Station. So I'm going to start off with some definitions here. Uh, being sentinel basically means standing guard or keeping watch to protect against predators. Many species exhibit sentinel behavior, but few have been proven to actually coordinate. The Florida scrub jay and the meerkat are two of the well-described cases of species that have been formally tested and quantified to actually engage in coordinated sentinel systems. Basically, coordination means that sentinel bouts are more evenly spread throughout time, um, more so than expected by chance, meaning that groups are actively reducing the time with no acting sentinel. This system is particularly beneficial for jays because they're not exactly very speedy in a getaway chase, but because they live in these very open habitats, being able to spot a threat from a distance plays as a huge advantage. And um, the biggest thing to keep in mind here is that jays really don't want any of those gaps in sentinel duties because then they'll become more vulnerable. So I'd like to explain some insight on why species might engage in sentinel coordination. So motivations for sentinel behavior has been described in this safe and selfish hypothesis, meaning that the sentinel is safe because they have an increased rate of detection and selfish because that detection acts as an advantage for rate and quality of incoming information. However, uh, sentinel coordination is considered mutualistic because it's beneficial for the sentinel to alert other members in the group in order to maintain that group size and um, have that advantage for risk dilution and future cooperative breeding numbers. So for cooperative breeders like the Flourish Scrub Jay, it is very beneficial to engage in coordination. And despite all of the benefits of coordination, we still might see some gaps in sentinel duties. And one reason that might be is just the sentinel foraging trade-off in the time budgeting of a jay. So when not foraging for food, the next best place to be is sentinel. This means that two hungry birds may be more likely to both forage at the same time, causing more gaps in sentinel coordination, and two satiated birds would be more likely to both stand as sentinel and reduce those gaps. So many factors affect the ability of groups to efficiently coordinate sentinel behavior. Larger groups have been shown to have decreased coordination, possibly because the mere addition of eyes may suffice as increased predator detection or the ability to know whose turn it is becomes more difficult as group size increases. Also habitat is another factor that plays a big role in coordination because in overgrown conditions, sentinel may lo no longer be safe due to reduced visibility. We'd expect that coordination would go down. And previous intern, Samantha Apgar, did show that groups are less coordinated in overgrown habitat when she um, did her study in 2015. Status also plays a major role in who's going to stand sentinel. So generally, um, individuals that have more efficient food finding ability, so older, more experienced males, will stand sentinel more frequently. However, this trend does differ between pair, um, new pairs and established pairs, with the male in new pair bonds standing sentinel significantly less than the male in established pair bonds and the female standing sentinel for a similar amount of time between the two. So this kind of leads into my hypothesis, thinking about that different amount of time uh, spent as sentinel between males in new pair bonds and established pair bonds. We'd um, expect that sentinel coordination would be positively correlated to pair bond duration, basically meaning that pair bond duration increases in years and degree of coordination would also increase. And part of the reason I was thinking this as well, we know that it's beneficial for Jays to stay in these long-term monogamous relationships and they become more successful over time as far as breeding opportunities go. So it's also predicting that they would become more coordinated. So. In order to test for their coordination, yay, math. Um, the Sentinel Coordination Index developed by Peter Benikoff in 2015 compares the observed bases versus the um, expected portion of time with no acting Sentinel. So in my example here, we can see that the male acts Sentinel for 31% of the time and the female acts Sentinel for 41% of the time. 
So based on that, we can calculate the probability that there would be no acting sentinel given those proportions of time to get our expected value of 0 0.398. However, during the actual observation, this group was observed to have no sentinel for only 0.2% of the time. So by subtracting these two values, the expected minus the observed, we come up with our degree of coordination. So the biggest thing to keep in mind is the more positive this degree of coordination is, the more coordinated the group, and the closer that value gets to zero, the less coordinated the group. We can also scale this observation to the relative amount of expected time and see that this pair reduced their gaps by 49.8%. Okay, oops, oh my gosh. Getting ahead of myself there. So the most important thing to mind here, I think um, this expected minus observed value, I'll refer to interchangeably as degree of coordination or coordination index. So my methods for employing this index for comparing um, coordination between new and established pairs, I conducted 60 minute observations on lone pairs from March to June of this year. If the J's left, I followed them and I discarded any time out of sight from the observation. And if the observation was less than 45 of the 60 minutes, I discarded the observation entirely. I recorded my GPS track location as I followed the J's and was able to calculate a few different things from that. Um, each time a J went up on Sentinel, I recorded the average scrub height 30 meters from the perch and also um, recorded. So I knew a J was up on Sentinel, basically if they were on a perch for at least 50 seconds and looking in all cardinal directions for at least 50% of the time. So I visited 49 pairs of J's and I did not repeat any pairs just to avoid pseudo-replications. So once I had all that data in hand, I went through and did my degree of coordination calculation. Also went through historical access data and recorded the pair bond duration for each pair. I used my GPS location to calculate the time since fire and the pine density of the area. I also um, took a weighted average of the estimated average scrub height. I used the automated weather station data from the property to average some of the weather variables. And I also recorded the reproductive stage that the pair was in at the time of observation. So with all of that, I had continuous and categorical variables. So I decided to run a generalized linear mixed model in R to analyze the effects of those variables on degree of coordination. So running my first model with all of the variables together, I ended up deciding not to include time since fire because it's highly related to estimated average scrub height, but it's not as good of an ecological measure. So um, I decided to exclude that variable and I didn't have time since fire data for all my groups anyway. So I took that one out. I also took out pines per hectare and the weather variables just because there is not a very significant um, p-value and I wanted to be able to isolate the effect of pair bond duration further. So all three of these findings were consistent with SAM in 2015 as well. So I decided to exclude them from my final model here. I ended up running this one with pair bond duration, estimated average scrub height and reproductive stage. So in bold, we can see that scrub height 30 meters from the perch and reproductive stage of eggs were strongly statistically significant. And in italics, pair bond duration and reproductive stage of fibers were marginally significant in their effect on degree of sentinel coordination. So looking a little further at those variables, this plot shows the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the estimated average scrub height as compared to sentinel coordination. So we can see that it's a negative correlation, meaning that as scrub height increases, the degree of central coordination decreases, um, which makes sense when we're thinking back to that safe and sentinel uh, hypothesis that as conditions become more overgrown, they have reduced visibility and become more vulnerable to attacks. So the motivation to coordinate de decreases. From the groups that I saw in um, more visible conditions as compared to the more overgrown conditions were 77% more coordinated, which is, this is also, this was Sam's um, project here was 
consistent with those findings. So here I'll look at the degree of coordination versus reproductive stage. So we, I found that um, reproductive stage of eggs and fibers was statistically significant as compared to the baseline of nothing. So this is possibly due to the fact that breeders are investing more time in foraging in stages of young and success, which makes sense when thinking about the sentinel foraging trade-off. When those breeders have got those extra mouths to feed, they'll be more inclined to forage over acting sentinel. And so sentinel coordination goes down in young and success and is higher during fibers and eggs. So on average, um, 39 pairs in fibers or eggs were 39% more coordinated than groups with young or successfully fledged nests. So sentinel coordination as compared to pair bond duration was only marginally significant, but I still think it's interesting to look at the general trend that we see when we plot this on a simple linear regression. So there is actually a slight trend of coordination to go down as pair bond duration increases, which is the opposite of my original hypothesis. And this is showing that pairs are less coordinated in longer pair bonds. So in summary, we know that sentinel coordination goes down in overgrown habitat and pairs are also more coordinated in stages of fibers and eggs. From this, we can interpret that sentinel coordination can be affected by a variety of different social and environmental contexts. But getting back to my original hypothesis that sentinel coordination would be positively correlated with pair bond duration, it kind of appears that the opposite trend is true, that pair bond duration increases and degree of sentinel coordination decreases. So I can speculate that this is possibly due to the fact that um, individuals in new pair bonds, one individual is always going to be new to um, the area and therefore less familiar with their surroundings and could influence them to coordinate more due to unknown threats in the area, like predators or territorial neighbors. And new pairs are also unfamiliar with each other. So closing gaps in sentinel coordination and standing sent sentinel simultaneously more frequently may be just to ensure those safe and selfish um, firsthand detection when they're with an unfamiliar mate forming a new pair bond. So this introduces a lot of interesting questions for motivation on why new pairs may reduce gaps more frequently. So from this, we might infer that st standing sentinel together may be an important aspect of forming a pair bond. So for future studies, I'd be interested to see if new pairs are reducing gaps and standing sentinel together more frequently, even if they're not satiated. So looking further into that, I think that a supplemental feeding study would be beneficial to understanding if new pairs are reducing gaps in sentinel coordination to the same degree as when satiated as compared to a control. I also think it'd be interesting to compare new versus established and fed versus unfed pairs, um, just to analyze the difference in degree of coordination. And from these findings as well, it'd be especially interesting to see in overgrown habitat if we see that fed individuals would stand sentinel less, even if they're satiated just due to those unsafe conditions. So the study that I ran, I think, could have been improved just with more samples on older pairs. Um, also, the time of year, we know that um, jays do stand sentinel more frequently in the wintertime when um, during hawk migration. So they may be more coordinated at a different time of the year as opposed to breeding season. And I think that the data that I did collect provides an interesting baseline as far as tracking those same pairs as the pair bond persists and see how coordination changes over time. Okay, so thank you all for listening and tuning in for our triple feature. I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Reed Bobin, Dr. Angela Tringali, Meredith Heather, and all my crew in the avian ecology lab. I need to thank my friends, my family, and all of the wonderful interns I've met along the way. So thank you all for listening. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Sure. That was great. Um, there's a few questions, but first uh, there's a great compliment, which uh, someone said that th this is not my field, um, but I completely understood the presentation. So oh, um, good. Great, great job of explaining a complex situation. Um, Kelly Roberts had a question and she said, did you notice if there were any differences in coordination 
between pairs that had nests fail versus those that were successful? Um, so I did not. I, I was kind of looking at that in general. So it didn't really look like um, nest success was like correlated with more coordinated pairs. Um, and again, that I think that in and of itself could be an entire study. I didn't really look too much into um, any of those other factors, but that could also be affected by a variety of different um, envi environmental effects and, and things like that. But we would expect to see that um, pairs in longer term bonds would be more successful. And more accolades on the chats about how good the presentation was. Um, another question, um, do the J's signal the partner in any way when they're coming down from Sentinel using a call or any other signal? So I'm kind of glad James went first because those conversation gutturals that um, he was kind of talking about play an interesting role. Um, there's been no proven, like, it's been a couple different um, theories on if J's have like a Watchman song or any kind of indication to the other members in the group that they'll be switching, but it's it's largely un, unstudied and it's difficult to tell because even with, say they are using the conversation on gutturals, even with James's presentation, you it would be very difficult to tell if the sentinel who's, you know, very high up in a perch is signaling to the foraging individuals. But I think it would be interesting to see um, basically whose responsibility it is to initiate a switch in sentinel duties. Is it the one who's foraging needs to go up and then the other one knows it's their turn to go down or vice versa? Thank you. Um, Catherine Prophet, who does a lot of work on Jays, um, wrote, might lower coordination with longer pair bonds be due to their familiarity with their habit and their neighbors? I, I would I would uh, interpret yes that that is likely what's happening so or I'm sorry I think I think I interpreted the opposite so they would be more I saw that they were more coordinated so let me just go back to my slide here I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question one more time just so well, I know um, that? The, the, the birds with longer pair bonds seem to be less coordinated. Yeah. Um, do you think that's because of their familiarity with their habitat and um, okay. their neighbors? Um, yeah, so that, that kind of taps back into like the deer enemy hypothesis with those longstanding boundaries um, with different territorial neighbors. They might be much more familiar with their surroundings and they're kind of they're kind of like, ah, well, this, you know, we know what's going on or that's just our loud neighbors. We don't have to worry too much, especially as um, older pairs become successful and they may, might even start budding, meaning that the one of their offspring may now take a little piece of their territory and they're not gonna be as defensive to that boundary next to them. So, um, yeah, I do think that the fact that new pairs are co more coordinated would be in part due to their own familiarity with their surroundings and vice versa. Um, Deborah said, do jays sentinel at nighttime or are they in their nests resting? I, I believe they just roost. Um, I, I don't know that they, I guess, I guess at that point, sentinel really is more for avian predators um, not so much for ground predators. So I don't think it would be beneficial for them to expend that energy in, in the night. They'd probably just stay and keep cover because they wouldn't have the visibility to see an avian predator, but. So Meredith asks, um, do you think uh, that time of day influence coordination? So some Jays seem to be much more active early in the morning and evening, and you and she wonders if it affects their coordination compared to midday. Sure, so um, I, I do think that it probably would affect their coordination just because 
they'll be more likely to stand sentinel once they're satiated. So it's possible first thing in the morning, they first woken up, they um, are still going to need to forage for enough resources to get them through the day. So they might be more uncoordinated first thing in the morning, but that's just me speculating. I, I don't think that I saw any um, difference based on time. I went um, from 7 a.m. to about like 11.30 and I also did a couple of evening um, observations as well and it didn't really seem to make a difference at least in my sample size, but I do think that's a possibility. Um, another question was, you did hour long observations on 49 territories, single observation. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was enough to, to capture the variation that might exist among groups? So I think, I hope so. I would hope so. <laughs> but I do think that just repeating this again at different times of the year throughout years um, would really provide a lot more insight. Also, I was really limited by the number of older pairs just based on um, who's out there. So I think that as far as the, I mean, this year was an incredible year too. We had a ton of new pairs this year. So I had a really good opportunity to visit a lot of those pairs. But um, as far as the increasing sample size, I think would always be a benefit. I'm sort of related to, to some of these questions. The, the pair with the longest pair bond had a mm -hmm. very low level of coordination. Um, do you think that that might've had an undue effect on the slope of that relationship? Yeah, I suppose that one was sort of an outlier, um, the, the longest term one. I, I think if I took that out, we, we might see less of um, a negative slope, but in general, it wasn't very statistically significant in the first place. A lot of what I was doing was speculating um, but in general, if we look at some of the, you know, even the three, six, nine, it does seem to um, have a slight trend of becoming less coordinated. So wh while you're on this graph, leave it up a sec, I'll ask a question, which is, um, I, I very much liked your explanation of how new pairs might be more co coordinated, but they're all sort of all over the place. Mm -hmm. Some are highly coordinated, some are very poorly coordinated. Do you have any idea what might drive the variation just within the new pairs? Um, that I would probably interpret as um, habitat or just the way that they've um, started their new territory as well. So again, going back to that, like budding, if, if a new pair has budded from their parents' um, territory, they may have an easier time um, and not have to worry about standing sentinel as much because they're much more familiar with the area than a de novo territory, which would be um, two breeders are completely new to the area. Um, yeah, so I, I do think there are, are a lot of factors that, that could influence it. And it does look like um, they're pretty evenly spread throughout um, coordination just for the one year pairs. Right. All right. Well, Thanks, Grace. And I'd like to thank all of the um, speakers today. It was really great to have everybody contribute. And um, only panelists can actually um, turn their microphones on, but um, it would be great to give you a little bit of applause. <laughs> so congratulations, everybody. Um, Good job, everyone. And thank, thank you, you for all listening. All everybody for um, sitting through uh, triple header so yes thank you everyone like us on facebook and check out the archful website to find out about our future seminar offerings and to subscribe to the archful newsletter you'll find these under the news and events tab on our website thanks so much everyone see you next time thanks everybody